Welcome, welcome everyone. Thank you so much. We are delighted to have you join us for the interconnectedness of plastic pollution and environmentalism, a waterside chat with youth activists, Bye Bye Plastic Bags, New Jersey tonight. Just a thumbs up, make sure everybody can hear me. You hear me? Good, okay, great. A few things to note before we get started, we will be having a question and answer afterwards, and there will be time for any questions you may have to be answered. If any thoughts come up while we're chatting, feel free to write your questions in the chat window, and we will read them in the order they are submitted during the question and answer session. I also want to remind everyone to please mute their microphones and to please keep them muted throughout the chat. My name is Rachel Don Davis, and I am the public policy and justice organizer for Water Spirit. I am joined tonight by Water Spirit's executive director, Blair Nelson, and our program manager, Abby Koshak. Water Spirit is one of several ministries in New Jersey established by the Sisters of St. Joseph of Peace. We are a center of ecology and spirituality that informs, inspires, and enables all people to deepen their consciousness of the sacredness and interdependence of all creation with a focus on water as critical in sustaining all life. Water Spirit presents a variety of programs, including weekly meditation sessions and seasonal equinox and solstice celebrations, such as the one this Friday, June 18th, coming up, register, and also advocates in partnership with others for clean, safe water for all and a just transition to renewable energy sources. Today, we have the pleasure of speaking with Youth activists, Porva Umradi and Arush Rampali from Bye Bye Plastic Bags, New Jersey. Welcome. Bye Bye Plastic Bags is a, an NGO driven by youth to say no to plastic bags. They envision a world free of plastic bags and where the young generation is empowered to take action across the globe. Their mission is to empower people to do what is right through education, campaigns, and political meetings. Start making that, that difference one bag at a time is their credo. So again, welcome. I'm going to jump right in because I know we have so much to cover. And so right off, we're going to start with, as most of us know, plastics are currently the most visible and measurable threat facing marine life, far more than any other environmental problem. Can you talk about the Bye Bye Plastic Bags organization and how the New Jersey branch got started? Where do you see the Bye Bye Plastic Bags movement in the greater, greater realm of plastic bag reduction? Yeah, thank you so much for the question. And I'm so excited. And thank you so much to everyone who's listening today. I think this is a really, really great opportunity for conversation. And I'm so, so inspired by the mission of Water Spirit. So thank you so much for having us today. Um, but yeah, Bye Bye Plastic Bags is really a global movement of youth raising awareness about the impacts of plastic pollution and working to ban single use plastics. And I really like that you mentioned um, that plastics are like both visible and a measurable threat, because that is really sort of what was the foundation for me to uh, and my friends and family to start uh, and found the New Jersey chapter. I mean, plastic pollution is such a visible and in your face issue that you can't walk away from. And it's really hard to avoid, unlike some more um, subtle issues for wealthy people to notice, like climate change and its effects, it can be much more complex to understand. And so on bus rides to school every single day or like visits to the beach and just every day in my community, plastic pollution was just really hard to escape. And it was something that affected a lot of people and litter was everywhere. And it was just a very common issue that it was seemed like a great starting point in terms of taking action and starting somewhere to give people and give young people a window into taking environmental action. And what I realized was that a lot of young people are out there who care, but they don't really have that starting place, that foundation or that base to start. So I really hoped that Bye Bye Plastic Bags and the New, Jer New Jersey chapter could be an outlet for young people to start getting involved, learn about plastic pollution, start exploring how intersectional it is and continue to take their advocacy much beyond uh, plastic pollution because it is one of so many different environmental issues that are plaguing our planet and then be able to become change makers for the rest of their lives because we are the future generation and it is in our power to create change. And so giving them that uh, motivation and empowerment was our ultimate goal that they could 
translate for the rest of their lives. So yeah, that was uh, ultimately our mission. And I think that definitely for me, uh, being involved in this community has been really empowering. And I know with uh, advocating against plastic uh, pollution and uh, reducing it in terms of policy as well, knowing that every single action we took, whether it was signing a petition, writing to our legislators and representatives, knowing that uh, every single action that we took had direct consequences was really empowering. And I think that it really kicked off a lot of the other environmental issues that I was able to speak out on. And every single webinar or event that we've held has been intersectional in some way. It wasn't like we were just talking about plastic pollution, but it was a great starting point for adding in conversations about environmental justice and the, many of these other issues. Um, and one example of this is that we hosted a webinar with uh, the Newark Water Coalition, and they are a community in Newark, New Jersey, trying to uh, advocate and ensure that the community has access to clean water and uh, uh, fight against the huge issue of water contamination that is still a problem to this day, despite many years of advocacy and trying to push back against uh, the lack of uh, investment and lack of uh, acknowledgement of the problems that the community is facing. So we were able to have a discussion about a lot of intersectionality because they had recently replaced um, the plastic bottles that they were distributing with a water box and that allowed for a lot of plastic to be saved every single year and a lot of uh, conversation and interlock was found in realizing that microplastics are also contaminating water and it's understanding that plastic is a form of environmental contamination and so all of these amazing conversations have come out of that. So we think that continuing to find even more ways that plastic pollution is affecting our planet allows us to create change and uh, become impactful citizens of our planet. Yeah, I really like um, that we're talking about how visible the issue is um, because plastic is something that we all use in our daily lives, whether you are an activist or you aren't. And so I think that it's something that every person has the ability to make a difference with regards to, but the problem is a lot of them don't know. They don't know that what they're using, these plastic straws, these plastic uh, single use bags, they don't understand that these are actually contributing to real problems around the globe. And so that's why I think that our organization is so powerful, not, not to like say that our organization is more powerful, but I'm saying in general, I think that organizations that not only aim to talk to legislators and like get them to pass the legislation, but also try to educate the public are so important because it's not like we're trying to wrest plastic bags away from people's hands. Like we're not trying to like force this on them. We're trying to educate them so that they are empowered to take those steps for themselves and find out that they're actually better off without them. So I think that, um, and also just seeing like youth stepping up and doing that, it sort of shows people that this is something that can be done. And, and if youth are, you know, motivated enough to be able to say, hey, this is something that I'm going to spend uh, like hours on to try and fight for this issue, then it's something that we really should be focusing on and we sh really should be talking about. Excellent. And uh, yeah, that leads me really, really nicely into, into our next question. Because young people are going to be bearing the brunt of everything that, every decision that we make today, um, and really that people in power and very, very powerful, well-funded corporations, all those decisions that are being made, um, young people do have the opportunity to use their voice as you both demonstrate in your daily lives and as leaders in your communities. There is in New Jersey a K through 12 climate change education sort of mandate now. This is the first state in the nation where this is the case. What are your thoughts on that? Just you know, understanding your own experience and then thinking about you're gonna be graduating very quickly or you, you know, you're, you're moving on very quickly throughout the, the school system. So, uh, you know, what are, what are your thoughts about this? How is this going to, you know, make an impact or how can it be best? I mean, I think that when I first heard about the K through 12 climate education mandate, I was really excited because I was like, this, they're finally going to be talking about this. This is something that's actually impacting our lives. And yet it's in none of our schools. Like people are graduating without even knowing about something that's literally going to affect them in like 20, 30 years. So I was really excited, but honestly, 
even though it's come out, I don't feel as though, like, I feel that climate change has become more of like a passing thing. It's like, yeah, climate change is happening. It's a politicized issue. Like that's really the context that it approaches in. Whereas it really should be approached as what can we do about it? You know, how can we act now to fix it? You know, it shouldn't be approached as something that's just a fact of regular life, but that's how I feel that it is approached in many classrooms. Um, and I think the reason for that is that there just isn't enough focus. Even with the mandate, schools aren't willing to invest more time in educating about the issue. And I think that's something that really needs to be addressed because this is an issue that honest, arguably like, sure, we learned trig, we learned bio, but this is something that we are actually going to have to face and come to terms with. And so you could argue that climate education is more important than anything else schools might have to teach us. And there are many ways that climate education could be mixed into like classrooms without, you know, inhibiting other subjects. You know, one example would be physical education. You know, a lot of kids don't like running around with a ball playing a sport. So why not encourage them to spend more time outdoors, go hiking, do something that really gets them in tune with nature and makes them understand why it's worth protecting and worth fighting for. And so I think that, honestly, I think that schools and legislators are just being lazy. They're just, you know, trying to fix a big issue with a very small mandate. And I think it's time that we need to step up and say, listen, schools, this is something that needs to be talked about. It needs to be talked about directly, not, you know, going around, beating around the bush. It just needs to be talked about. And more than that, it needs to be extended to show kids that they have a responsibility and they also have an opportunity to act on climate change, not just climate change, but any environmental issue. Yeah, I think that was so well said. And I know that when I first heard about it, I was really hopeful because I was like, this is finally when it's going to start happening, the conversation start happening, because I had never like seen it be so normalized in my schools. It was such a rare point to talk about. And even then it was just limited to recycling, reduce, reuse, recycle, and just all of these like overused phrases without actually going any deeper beyond the surface level into these issues. So I was definitely hopeful about it, but at the same time, like R said, I just don't know how far it's going to go. And it's like having the legislation is great, but as long as it's not implemented, not many of the changes might actually take place. So starting to see some of the changes take place is definitely um, exciting and uh, makes me like feel a little bit more hopeful. Um, and one example of this is I know in my sister's class, um, they actually uh, for math, they, uh, she's doing algebra one and they were able to create solar ovens using like pizza boxes, cardboard, uh, aluminum foil, and just a bunch of things. And they were able to like test um, how it was improving the um, heat transferabilities of water and also understand the topic that they were learning, which was conics. And I just think it was so amazing because they were able to connect uh, harnessing the power of the sun to create energy to something that you would never expect to be able to connect environmentalism to. And I think that's just one example. Like Arsh is saying, it could be incorporated into physical education and so many other classes in school, like science and history, and really understanding, you know, what are the roots of this issue? And then as it continues to be normalized in classroom conversations, it'll also be normalized in conversations for kids to have with their friends as well. And especially because it's an issue, like R said, it's gonna be something that affects us. It's affecting us right now and it's gonna be affecting us a lot more in the future. What better way to start than start incorporating it into our education system? So I'm definitely um, excited for the bill, but I'm also really, really hoping that both students and uh, administration will push teachers and encourage them to start incorporating these things into their curriculum. Because I know that a lot of teachers, one, are already hesitant, or they might not just feel like they are allowed to talk about these things because they have so many standards put in place and so much pressure put on them to complete X, Y, and Z in the course of a year that they just might not have the depth and breadth to be able to cover a lot of these issues. So. I really hope that administrations will really take a step forward to push forward and continue to advocate for uh, better education, climate education and environmental education. Because I know that if I had that, I would have been like so much less anxious and stressed out. And I think eco-anxiety is something that young people are also dealing with on a regular basis. We see these news headlines and information about, you know, in 10 years, like so, climate change is gonna ravage the planet and destroy the world as we know it, like 
nothing is going to be the same again and like the damage that's going to be created is irreversible and it just seems so overwhelming like we can't do anything about it but i think if we had education on solutions and how we can um have careers in these areas a lot more kids would be encouraged to learn more and also pursue it in the future so i think that education is like one of the most powerful tools to create change yeah and because you brought up eco anxiety pura I, I just want to like add it like we've seen the world change like we're seeing the world change right now and so just the fact because like you know from childhood we're sort of like in this bubble like we don't think that anything we do can have that like long lasting consequences but like we're seeing the world change right now and we know it will never be the same and so I think just the pandemic itself has also shifted and you know made eco anxiety more of a real thing because like if the world could change so much because of a pandemic then how bad is it going to be when climate change really hits? You know, so I think that that has also been exacerbated by the pandemic. Yeah, well said. And thank you so much for those contributions because, um, you know, as we recognize, we do offer eco anxiety support at Water Spirit um, that you will be best off if you are prepared with solutions in hand, with tools in your toolbox. And we hope that, you know, that that will only grow. Um, and again, just thinking about the massive problem and the and the sort of powerlessness youth can feel. Um, are you seeing any programs that are working to stop larger corporations to stop using plastic? And how are they being held accountable um, for their plastic pollution? Is that something you're looking into? I think that like right now, a corporation's biggest defense is greenwashing. You know, we see like companies try to brand themselves as environmental, but in fact, they're, they, they're exaggerating. It's just an exaggeration to try and make themselves seem like they're saving the planet when really they're, they're not doing anything. So like you see that, especially with fast fashion companies, you see them say like, oh, this was 100% cotton, but you don't consider how much water was needed to make those jeans. And it's just like, I think that's really what corporations are relying on to fool the public. And in that regard, I think it's the our legislators job to sort of crack down and say, hey, you need to be more responsible. Like those are the two like areas, government and corporations, you know, business and, you know, leg legislation. And both of them have the power to influence one another. And so I think that if legislators started cracking down on corporations saying, hey, it's not OK for you to make more money by taking advantage of the environment corporations would have no choice. They would have to, you know, and also I think there's a certain amount of public awareness that needs to be, you know, uplifted. You know, people need to be educated about the fact that, you know, these companies aren't actually green. They're just telling you they are, and you, you're just going along with it because you don't know any better. It's not the people's fault that they don't know these things. It's, you know, they're just not, they just don't know. And so I think that that's another, uh, reason why we need organizations that educate people about these problems and bring them to light because otherwise you're letting corporations get away with basically lying to the masses and encouraging them to buy more and more of these products that are actually harming the environment. Yeah, I definitely agree with that. And I think that um, aside from like just one organization or a group of organizations uh, working to hold these uh, corporations accountable, I think it is a lot, just like an entire community of people, activists and young people that are doing just that. Um, we saw like the movement of climate strikes happening around the world. And a lot of that was all about holding them accountable, demanding action and making ourselves heard. Like, we're not going to stop. We're not gonna just like back down and just like um, be cleaning up litter in our neighborhoods. Like this is a global effort and we need the companies that are accountable, you know, there's like 100 companies that are responsible for 70% for of greenhouse gas emissions. Like we see and recognize that you are part of the problem and your greenwashing efforts aren't going to like stop us or make, or make us believe otherwise. So knowing that there's like a large uprising of young people um, that are like holding these companies accountable is something that has encouraged me to learn more and driven me to care more as well. Um, and there's an organization called Polluters Out that's dedicated to specifically holding these companies accountable for their actions. And I think with alongside greenwashing, with which so many people have like 
been fallen into the trap to believe that some of the companies contributing to fast fashion and other huge environmental problems are actually have these environmental sustainable like clothing lines and things like that. Um, at the same time, there is also the issue that the fossil fuel industry is still being given space at like climate conferences and these huge big uh, community like conferences and um, meetings with executives environmental executives and being given way too much space at the table when that space should be given to the marginalized communities that are being affected by these issues. So it's time that we like took action and stopped them from taking any more space than they already are because they're the ones polluting and there's, they're the ones who are being given a voice. So they're gonna continue to take advantage of people and minorities as they continue to have that spot. So the goal of that organization is really to ensure that they no longer have that spot. And instead it's given to the people who are most vulnerable and being affected by environmental issues. So I just put the link to the website in the chat and definitely take uh, a look at it and peruse it. But yeah, I think that ultimately it's all about um, community level action, despite the fact that our individual actions do have an impact at the end of the day, it's key that we understand that coming together as a community because all of the environmental organizations out there have something in common, a lot of uh, foundational understanding that the planet is in danger and we all need to do something about it and channeling that energy to create change across the globe and hold these companies accountable is ultimately, I think, the key to making change. Nice. Great answers. <laughs> Uh, really just thinking about all of the consumption that we do and the information that you had mentioned that people consume. And I'm just wondering for you personally, how do you think the reduction of plastic correlates with spirituality? How can people benefit from connecting with their spirit at this time? Yeah, so I think for me, definitely, I feel like overwhelmed with school or just like a lot of things on a daily basis and like all the time. So finding spirituality and finding time to be outdoors, to be just among nature uh, frequently has like helped me in so many different ways. I feel like sort of connected with the um, energy that like we find in every single corner of our planet, you know, in listening to the fact that there is so much life out there beyond just my computer screen after like six hours on a Zoom call is just so relieving and relaxing. And I think that, you know, having that, those natural, beautiful places to go to is such a blessing and we are starting to lose that. And that's something that, I'm really afraid of and spirituality allows me to remind myself of how important it is that we continue fighting and continue protecting it. So it's really an ongoing cycle of one, taking the action and then two, understanding that it has an impact and that we are going to be able to protect um, our future and future generations and give them the pristine planet that they deserve to have. And what makes me really sad is that it is the most marginalized and vulnerable communities that may least have the ability to access that spiritual place in nature because they are uh, often the ones that are built along the fence line of a industry or uh, forced to deal with air pollution and so many huge environmental problems. And they are uh, missing out on a lot of the wonders that our planet has to offer. And so a lot of the times when I do get to go out and explore nature, I feel so blessed and so grateful to have been given that opportunity. And I wanna do everything I can to help make sure that others have the same. Yeah, I think that was a beautiful answer, Puda. Um, for me, my earliest like memory, if you like just said the word environmentalism, you asked me what I thought of, it would be me sitting in the auditorium of my second grade school, watching a play about Earth Day. And when I think about that now, it just seems to me like a parody of environmentalism because I have, the more that I have engaged with environmental groups like Bye Bye Plastic Bags and Water Spirit and Green Amendments for Generations, the more that the outside has felt 
like more real, you know, especially in a time when we're viewing the world through a computer screen and nothing's like everything seems artificial. Just going outside and being able to sit in my own backyard and hear the bees humming and just smell fresh air is a blessing, you know, and I think that when you know, you get discouraged and you start like getting overcome by eco anxiety and all those things, you just need to consider how hard are we willing to fight to protect these places, you know, what would it be like if the world really was confined to a computer screen, and we had nowhere else to go. And so I think that's really where the spirituality lies for me. Um, because the more that you fight for the earth, the more that you realize there is to save, and the more that you aren't willing to lose. Thank you so much. And I know that intergenerational art activism is something that we've talked about a lot before, uh, but I wanted to give you the opportunity to talk about the importance of, of art in activism. Uh, and I know I had shared that I'd heard about just the, the urban uprising of global youth with respect to connecting this movement all over the world because we are so connected and sometimes that's a really good thing in a digital space because we do have the opportunity to share those experiences and share you know that we are having those same feelings like you were both talking about and like we know many people are experiencing with respect to ego anxiety and then this hope and this flow of creativity that can flow out uh is is so rejuvenating and it happens in nature and it happens when we create art and when we're with community uh doing doing things that are expressive. Uh, so if you could tell us a little bit about the art that you've been able to work on with your groups uh, throughout the last couple of years, that'd be great. I mean, I know that Bye Bye Plastic Bags is currently collabing with uh, Megasife, who also had his own waterside chat, which was amazing by the way, so go check it out. But we're actually collabing with him to produce a song and or album. And the reason, like basically the, the idea behind that project is really just that music and art in general is a way of connecting people who are facing different things and especially people of different generations, because it's something that speaks to us all on a very fundamental level. And it just makes the issue so much more palatable. It's so much easier, or maybe not easier, but it's more accessible to, the information is more accessible when it's given as something that we can all connect to or relate to something that we experience in our own lives than if it's just presented as like nuggets of fact, because those are hard to swallow, you know, and they're hard to really feel because a lot of environmentalism is about feeling. It's about wanting to save the environment. You can't be an environmentalist and not care about the environment. So it's not just about, you know, we need the earth because we'll die without it. It's like, we want to save the earth because we deserve an earth that is beautiful. And that, you know, isn't just sufficient. It's, more than sufficient it's everything that it was and everything that it needs to be and so i think that music and art in general just totally like transmit the emotion that is so underlying in all environmentalism yeah i love the point you made about you know it not being about just the facts because they are a big part of the conversation and while they are certainly important um they don't really convey the um, overwhelming level of the like what's at stake and a lot of environmentalism is connected to our emotions how we feel and the impact it has on us on a personal a mental emotional spiritual level so I think that a lot of those feelings kind of get washed away when you just look at the information and data um, while it is really important uh, to the conversation so this actually reminds me of that this past summer, I participated in this really amazing program called Climate Speaks. And it was all about connecting young people to the opportunity to share um, their connection to the environment and to climate change through art. Um, so I got the amazing opportunity to perform spoken word poetry about the environment. And so I chose to write it all about um, fireflies. And so, when I was first getting the idea to write this poem, I was looking back at uh, poems that I'd written in the past and I found something that I wrote in fourth grade. It was an acoustic poem about fireflies talking about how beautiful they looked dancing in the night, um, the glow, you know, how beautiful they were. And I was just so mesmerized by them at a very young age. 
And as the years went on, I started noticing that they were slowly disappearing. And so I decided to like channel like that uncertainty and fear into the poem. And I noticed that so many people in the audience, like more than a lot of the other events that I was able to participate in were like, yes, I felt the same way or wow, I've never thought about this this way before. And now that I think of it, it makes so much more sense. And now I feel like empowered and like, I feel like I should do something about it. So having that sense of community and understanding was so beautiful because I was able to convey to other people exactly how I felt in those moments starting from the amazing excitement and the hope that I felt that I would be able to continue dancing among the fireflies for the rest of my life to all of a sudden, is this even gonna be there for me yet in the future anymore? So being able to convey that through a poem was different than any other um, event or like informational session that I could have shared that information with. So I think that art has created so many outlets for people to express themselves and it doesn't necessarily have to be visual art. It could be writing in your diary. It could be going outside and letting yourself feel nature. And it could be so many different things that you just allow yourself to channel your emotions and what you're feeling into your daily life. So I think uh, that it's definitely been really exciting to see more art being connected to the environmental space and definitely with Bye Bye Plastic Bags, that's something that we're continuing to try to do. Um, I know around Christmas time, we uh, released like a 12 days of eco-friendly Christmas song where we changed up the lyrics and you can definitely check out our YouTube channel if you want to see that. I can post the link in the chat soon. Um, and recently also for Earth Day, we created a collage out of everyone in our organization's um, pictures of themselves in nature, um, photo photography that they did in nature, different pieces that they created. And there were some really, really beautiful ones there. And if you want to like look at those, you can definitely check out our Instagram page for that. But yeah, it's just been really, really exciting to see how young people are able to like channel a lot of the wonderful, wonderful things that they've created into environmentalism and understand that their whatever projects that they're working on don't have to be like separated from environmentalism, but that they can also use um, the fact that they care so much and channel it into their art. So yeah, combining the two has been like really powerful. And I've noticed that the effects have really allowed people to create a lot of change in their community. Yeah, and I also, I also want to add, we also had, during our fast fashion webinar, we had like a fast fashion runway, like show kind of, and it was like a contest. And so, I don't know, I, I, I think that like, for me, I'm not much of a painter, you know, I'm not much of like the typical artsy, like pottery stuff like that. But that was fun, because I just took like random stuff like trash, because it was supposed to be made out of things that would ordinarily be thrown out, and then like reusing it to make something new. Um, and so I just found that fun because like I like being crafty. So I think that art isn't necessarily it doesn't necessarily have to be restricted to like what we might traditionally be considered art. You know, there's a lot of different outlets that art also offers. And I think that's another important, you know, freedom that art gives us to express ourselves. Beautiful. Thank you so much. I have put the link in the chat to the Bye Bye Plastic Bags New Jersey resources Google Doc. And with that, I would like to open it up for question and answer. Anyone has any questions? I have a comment, not a question. And before I get to it, I do want to say a a big thank you to you both for being here. I mean, your passion for what you do and for this planet comes across very clearly, as well as your clear-sighted analysis of um, the situation that we're in and the kind of action that we need to be taking. So I really appreciate your perspectives. Um, you know, there's so much from this conversation that's already been so rich, you know, talking about eco-anxiety, talk about um, art and activism and how action in the world around an issue doesn't have to take any one particular form. In fact, it, you can use your strengths and your unique gifts to bring about the change you wanna see. So I really appreciate you know, hearing your perspectives on these issues. Now to get to the comment, that's not actually a question. Um, uh, it's, it's an invitation to continue the conversation around corporate responsibility and um, 
around plastics, including greenwashing or not. I was recently catching up on um, the United Nations high level debates on the ocean, which just happened earlier this month. And during um, those talks, I learned about a movement that's building toward an international plastics treaty. I think most of the movement is happening in the United Nations in Environment um, Assembly at this point in time, um, from what I understood from the talk. But a few people were referencing um, a recent report that came out that I want to I want to pull up a little text about to make sure I talk about it correctly. It's a new report by WWF, the Ellen MacArthur Foundation, and Boston Consulting Group. And this report finds that a new international treaty on plastic pollution will benefit both the environment and business, accelerating global efforts to tackle the eradication of plastic pollution. And they had about 30 major um, brands or retailers sign on to this treaty. So I haven't had a lot, or, or onto this report calling for a plastics treaty. So I haven't had a lot of time to learn. This is a new area for me, but I would love to continue the conversation with you folks later about what and you know, an international plastics treaty might look like and what some important elements are to that to make sure that it is in fact effective um, and you know, to the benefit of us all not perpetuating you know, empty gestures. Yeah, I mean, this could totally, I mean, I obviously hadn't, ch hadn't had a chance to look at it, but I think that this could totally be, you know, because we have seen plastic, uh, pollu anti-plastic pollution movements making, you know, advances across the globe. And so I think it's really cool that, you know, there is actually calls for an international treaty that could sort of, you know, be the first step. But like, I think the thing to also remember about that is it is only a first step because, like passing the legislation that will prohibit it, even if it is like super effective, it also needs to be enforced. And that's kind of the thing that we're facing because New Jersey was um, the first state to pass the Plastic Pollution Reduction Act. Um, and like when I first heard, I was like, yay, we're done, we did it, woo! And then I was like, well, actually food, I was like, um, actually, we still got a lot of work. So basically we still have to like help people shift away from plastic. You know, we can't just be like, okay, now get rid of your plastic. We have to like show them ways to manage without plastic, you know, alternatives, substitutes, things like that. And, you know, educate them on why they need to transition away from plastics too, you know, cause people are kind of stubborn, you know, they won't just listen to legis legislation blindly. And so I think that that's also an important thing to remember. Like you shouldn't get carried away like I did and be like, it's solved, you know, we're done. We don't have to worry about it anymore because there's so much more work to be done. But I think that this is a really strong first step if it, it does end up getting uh, created. And I'm really proud of the world, which doesn't happen often. Yeah, I'm definitely really excited about this treaty. Um, I actually don't know much about it. So I'd love to read more about it and learn more. But I think like what you said about, you know, no more empty promises. I think it would be amazing to have like some sort of a like youth led like conference where we can like discuss this and like what would be like our goals and like our hopes for what we would want to get out of this and what we would want to see the world's next steps be and like maybe draft up some sort of uh, document where we like list like what our goals and like what our demands might be uh, for what we want with it. I think that'd be a really great like next step and I'd love to have that conversation and like explore it more. It seems like really cool. And like Arv said, yeah, I'm actually like really excited and hopeful that this is maybe like a great stepping stone for us to like start making international headway for plastic pollution action. And Marianne, I just saw what you wrote in the chat about Maine. I think that's really cool. The fact that it's sort of spreading, you know, because uh, Maine is a very like nature, like when you think Maine, you think forest, you think. So I, I think it's great that they're, you know, starting to take steps to prevent plastic pollution from really becoming an issue there. Um, yeah, I think, especially with regards to like, if they're, you know, holding companies financially responsible, that could mean a lot of local businesses that are being affected by that sort of legislate legislation. So I think that's super cool. Yeah, and I think that like, for New Jersey as well, like, we could definitely learn from like what they're doing as well. And I think that that's like, what's kind of cool of like doing this on a state level, like we've been able to connect with uh, buy by plastic bags uh, groups and like we have like a buy by plastic bags USA community with like the chapters in several other states but there's still like several states without chapters but they have like a lot of active like organizations working to tackle plastic pollution so it'd be really amazing to like connect us all on 
this um, International Plastic Pollution Treaty and also the Break Free from Plastic Pollution Bill, which is, I think, like on the US uh, floor. So I'm not sure like what the update on that is, but I'll definitely be sure to look into it. Yeah, and Pura, I really like what you said about um, like other organizations. I think that's also an important point that can get lost sometimes. Like environmental organizations are not like fighting each other to try and get their initiatives passed. Like an organization that is focused on water or focused on like mining or fossil fuels, they can also advance plastic pollution with their own goals because all of these issues are interconnected. You know, it's not like, you know, plastic pollution is an issue unto itself. You know, everything is connected, especially in the world of corporate and government. And so, you know, collaboration between these groups which have different missions could be very, which is very successful. We are seeing success when these organizations come together and say, hey, we, ju we just at our core level, we want a protected environment. You know, whether that means plastic pollution, whether that means fossil fuels, we just want a protected environment. So I think that was also a really good point that Puda raised that it's not just, you know, bye bye plastic bags, it's also other environmental organizations that are stepping up and saying, this is also a problem that we need to solve. Excellent. Thank you. Does anyone else have any other questions for chance? I have a question for you guys. Um, so it's kind of shocking to think that every single piece of plastic that's ever been created still exists on this planet. Um, and not everyone probably knows this, but plastic photo degrades instead of biodegrades which means that over time, all this plastic waste that is found on land and in our oceans breaks down into smaller and smaller and smaller particles known as microplastics. And these particles enter the global food chain eventually affecting every single living thing, including humans. Um, the good news is though, is that plastic pollution is preventable, which you guys have suggested these um, different ways that it can be and um, what Bye Bye Plastic Bags New Jersey and its other partner organizations are doing, you know, you guys use education campaigns and political meetings to empower people to do what is right and to take action on these issues. My question for you guys is what has been the outcome thus far when you approach people to change these habits and to try these alternatives to go more towards a zero waste lifestyle? Yeah, thank you so much. That's such a great question. And I think like a lot of the times when we approach people who aren't in the environmental space, it's more just like people like we're trying to educate and stuff. I'm definitely like the most nervous because I'm like, how are they going to react? Like, are they just going to be hesitant and stuff? But I've noticed that with the conversations that we've been having, it's been a really, really great response. Like, uh, people are like definitely eager to help in some way, or at least like willing to like listen to us, which I think is really great. And I think like the problem in the past with like people being so like turned away from taking environmental action is it's just like such a big problem. And I know like there's so many times in my life where I was just like, this is too much. Like I give up. I can't do anything else. Like I'm just one person. Like what impact do I have? So I think that's like where the community action came in and understanding that we are like, this is so much bigger than one person or like one person's impact. Um, and I know that like people can be like, this is um, like when they look at this issue and they look at a lot of the ways that it's portrayed in media, it can almost feel like these articles and this information is trying to guilt trip you and make you feel like you're that like, pr you're the problem. Like humans are, humans are like, the problem humans are like the cause of environmental damage like we are anti-nature we are like anti-environment when it's like not that's like the exact opposite of the narrative that we want to paint we want people to know that you are part of the environment and we want to help you protect the planet so that it can protect you and it's like all about helping people understand that there's small things definitely that you can do in your life which is why like in every webinar and like every event, event that we like share a few tips on like how they can reduce plastic consumption and things like that. But moving beyond that to help them understand that there's so many people just like them out there 
and how they can like just plug into this movement. They don't have to invest much of their time, but they can like attend this short event or like get involved in this small like community cleanup or something like that and find a lot of people where they can talk to these issues about and also find a way to learn more. So I think having that educational aspect, but also helping them understand that they can be part of the solution instead of feeling like they are part of the problem and giving them hope instead of making them feel sad and fearful about the issue. And I know that a lot of the times, like when plastic pollution is mentioned, it's always like most of the time, especially in like mainstream media, it's mostly just like images of wildlife getting entangled or like dying from consuming plastics. Those are like the kinds of things that tend to go viral. So when people see that, yeah, they like are like sad and they feel like maybe like a twine of guilt, but like after that, like they're really not sure what the next step is going to be. They will probably just move on with their lives and be like, this is just a fact of reality. I guess I'll just have to live with it and avoid having to think about it. So yeah, I think like the goal like with us is like we really want to address this by making sure that people have an outlet to understand that they are capable of doing something instead of just having to feel like they have to just move on and accept the reality. Like it's it shouldn't just have to be something that we accept. It could be something that instead we all work together to do something about, even if it doesn't end up being like the perfect level of action that we would hope for. Hopefully it encourages um, companies to, to create change. Hopefully it uh, allows legislators to pass uh, bills that uh, work in our favor. And hopefully it allows us to protect our planet uh, in a better way. So creating those direct connections, telling people to sign petitions, write to their legislators. You know, there's so many people that didn't, don't even know about it. And I know like went for me when it was like the first time that I was writing to my legislator, like writing it like by hand, it was so exciting. I felt like they would actually like maybe read it. Maybe one of their staffers would read it. And I got a response from one of my representatives. I just like felt so heard and seen. So those kind of steps, are what encourage people to take action. Not seeing the effects of plastic pollution over and over again and constantly feeling like they're invalidated and they just don't know what to do. So I think just continuing to encourage people to reach out and make a change because as we continue to create change, I think it like leads to a larger and larger wave of people coming together and joining forces. Yeah, I agree with everything that Pura has said. Um... One other thing I wanted to bring up was I think that honestly making it like a game often appeals to people because we all know humans run away from difficulties. You know, you tell someone to change their life and we get the defense mechanisms. And so I think that one of the ways to put those away and like kind of get everyone on the same playing field is to make it like a game. So we've done like bingo challenges um, where like you have to try and do a certain number of environmental challenges. And if you fill out a row, you get a shout out on social media, things like that. We've done the fashion, the fast fashion, um, runway contest thing. So I think that those are really effective because it's, it sort of dulls the issue and makes it more about having fun as, as that sounds weird, but like, it's about, it makes it more like a game. It makes it seem less like reality, like in your face kind of thing. But then as people keep on doing that, they find that they've become habits and they find that they're automatically more conscious, you know? And so like those games kind of promote the same kinds of thinkings that we're trying to instill in them through education. Um, I also wanted to kind of change the question slightly to focus more on legislators. So I used to think like legislators were like this, like different, like group, like they were just like untouchable. You couldn't contact them. They were just like cut off from society and they did whatever they did in their offices and that was it. But then I got involved in environmental, like even like Pura was talking about how she sent a letter to her legislators. I did one of those too, but I completely was like, I felt like I was writing to like, you know, I don't even know, like some like higher being. Like I was just like, they will see my letter and maybe they'll read it. And maybe I'll be lucky enough to get a response, you know? And it's really not like that. Like our legislators are just people. They're people from our community. They are people like the people who surround us. The only difference is they're elected to sit in office and make decisions on behalf of us. And so, yeah, like Rachel said, legislators depend on us. They want to be reelected. That is, that is their whole modus operandi. So, you know, they depend on us. Our voices matter. If we tell them that we want something done and they don't do it, 
they have problems. They are in trouble. So legislators will listen to you. And they're not like I thought, they're not like some, you know, higher being that, you know, you just have to obey and, you know, go along blindly with. They are just people. And if you talk to them, they will listen. At the very least, they will listen. You know, they may not change. They may decide that, you know, oh, you're just a kid. Though, to be honest, I have not received many of those you're just a kid responses. You know, I've actually had legislators who talked to me on the same playing field. Like, it wasn't like they were elevated or anything. But I attribute that to many of the young activists that we are seeing in the world today. They sort of laid the groundwork that I'm walking on. Um but I am glad that I didn't have to deal with a lot of those roadblocks that a lot of people probably had to face when kids started stepping up to talk to their legislators. Um, but yeah, I just feel like in the end of the day, it's sort of demystifying all that, that like jazz that surrounds legislators, all the drama, everything, and just simplifying them down to people who have to listen to you, you know? And if you make a good claim and a good statement, you give evidence and you make sure that you are powerful and passionate, they will listen. They have to listen. And I think that's something that's really important to keep in mind when you are talking to legislators or lobbying legislators. Thank you so much. I think that that is a great point to end on. Um, and yeah, I just wanna highlight that your approach and really to anyone watching, whatever approach you choose to take with your legislator, it can be mirrored. And so Arush has just proven the, you know, excited, well-informed, smiling, person to person, human being to human being, heart to heart. Those are the conversations you can have. And that's something that Water Spirit has really been priding uh, ourselves on just in terms of fostering this dialogue that is very difficult to have, but that must be had where we can have 100% renewable powered everything, namely in, the most vulnerable communities in our state of New Jersey, as well as across the country. But you know, first and foremost, this is where we all live, where we all work. We are all human. This is a global human community, and our young people are all of our all of the young people are, matter to us and and should be you know given the the mic right so to speak. And I just wanted to share. I know you're you're working on the Green Amendments campaign on um, the New Jersey Green Amendment. And I want to lift up that young people did have a great press conference that did get some coverage and some legislator uh, attendance and increasingly so as we speak even more. I just wanted to lift up a point where someone had mentioned um, perhaps Ava Berlotti about money talking. And that is true. And we've talked about that a bunch tonight. And I just wanted to lift up that Maya Van Rossum shared so do votes. And young people are going to be the majority population in our country, in our state. And you have the power through your vote to make change. So elect people who are going to represent you and stay engaged, right? It can be, it can be fun. I don't know if that's the right word, but it is more exciting to be in it than to wonder and, and think of it as something that it really isn't, as you so, so uh, clearly shared, Arush. Yeah, I think that's a great point you brought up that um, like you should you you are you have a responsibility when you're voting. It's not just like they hand you a ballot and it's like, yeah, I got a ballot I get to use. It's like you have a responsibility. You are putting people in office that you're giving them power. You're handing them power. So you have a responsibility to learn about them. Don't be fooled by like a lot of times like our two main parties will create drama. They'll orchestrate drama so that they get more coverage. You know, because if you get more coverage, then more people are likely to vote for you. And as sad as that is, that is the political reality. So don't get fooled by that drama. You know, like we saw the um, 2020 presidential debate, so many ad hominem attacks, you know, attacks on the pe person, not on the idea. So don't get fooled by those kinds of things like those, because those are just to try and get like ratings. Essentially, you could think of it as like a, a TV show. They're trying to get ratings. They're trying to get people to watch them. You know, so don't be fooled by that. Focus on the actual ideas that they're expressing and the, the agendas that they're trying to advance. Because at the end of the day, this is our country. And, you know, we have a responsibility to take the power we have been given as voters and to put it in the hands of the people that we think are actually best for the nation, not the people who have the spotlight on them most of the time. Yeah, and I also wanted to add, like, just the importance of, like, not just participating in the... Um, national election, but also the importance of local elections and how much, um, how important they are in terms of like how they represent your community and how many of the decisions they're making in terms of the environment and just in general, in terms of your health and your community uh, that they're gonna be making for you. In fact, like maybe even more um, than 
the national government. And so I think that like, like Rachel was saying, I think that it can be really fun. And I'm actually going to be 18 by next, uh, this coming November. So I'm kind of excited because I know even like last year, like it was really exciting to like have those conversations with my friends and like think about, you know, like what are the things that I want in the person that's representing me, you know? And I think that like, uh, as we continue to approach it as something that we should all be doing, and it can be something that's fun. I think that like more and more young people are going to be out there and show up to vote. And I think that this last election, I heard that a lot of young people showed up to vote too, which is really exciting. Um, so yeah. We're only seeing record numbers. So may we move forward together and not one step back. <laughs> Thank you so much again. Thank you everyone for coming. We will be sharing the resources after in an email. So fear not, we will be sharing every single link that we shared and more possibly. <laughs> um, and if anyone has any questions, feel free to email us always at water at waterspirit.org. Thank you so much for coming and thank you to our guests.